<laughs> you ever do that in your next stick? <laughs> oh, not that kind of foolishness on the tape. Jesus. Act ser natural. Serious, that's it. All right. I thought we would continue a bit more regarding how explanations, even and especially from experts, are mistakenly taken as being causes. And they are always based on some unanalyzed, picking up some of the terms we were using last time, they're always based upon some sort of unanalyzed factual fabrication, sorts of things that if you just took ordinary intelligence, not my opinion, not your opinion, but if you just took the way life at its best, the way ordinary thinkers, the way ordinary people believe that the mind should operate and what is reasonable, etc. If you took it one more inch, if you added one more ounce of effort toward it, that's what I mean by unanalyzed factual fabrications, these kind of, the basis of the expert explanations will not stand. You recall where we were. Uh, well, such as, you recall the problem that, or the example, how common it is nowadays for experts. And it's just as serious and as meaningful as it can be for it to be uh, whatever the particular area is on the basis that it is some unhealthy influence of our society has, is causing some, some specific individual problem. Like the unhealthy picture that our society presents to women to make them starve themselves and get, you know, have eating disorders and even kill themselves. And everybody, psychiatrist, you and everybody else will sit there and I mean, it's just, it's irrefutable it seems, other than the fact if you push it one more inch you know not being smart elect and not having anything to prove because it doesn't prove anything in the ordinary world. But for someone attempting to, oh, just be weird. Somebody attempting to do that if you say uh, there's no society outside of man. There is no Harvard outside the people. There is no Catholic church. There is no Islam without the followers. There is simply no such thing as any institution. There is no such thing as anything in the secondary world outside of man. There is no society. I know what they mean by it. You know what they mean by it. It's in the dictionary. Everyone uses it. But notice, you cannot analyze, you cannot go past that kind of irrefutable, contemporary, intellectual, insightful explanation that so-and-so, such individual problems as all sorts, eating disorders, stress on children, it is a kind of unhealthy pressure of our society. People make a living off of it. It's part now of the fueling system, the mechanics that run the world except it will not stand any analyzation. Not from my view, from their view. If they would run their mind, if they could take that machine, take the operation, and just speed up the RPMs just one more per second, if they could push it just one more inch, a millimeter, the way it's going. And of course, one reason it's ridiculous is if you do push people and they listen, there's no way to explain this, but I've said it this way, and I'll say it again. Everybody knows this. <laughs> that is, everybody knows, well, you know, all oh, this is just a joke. I mean, it's a, it's a, well, it's ordinary people, if they're pushed, they go, all right, this is all just a joke, or else it's a bad joke. This is some kind of dream. Or they might have an uncle that says, no, this is some kind of nightmare. <laughs> so it's not that big a secret. It's just that <coughs> nobody wants to think about it. <laughs> How about that? So that's what we mean by factual fabrication. It's what ordinary people call a lie, but it's not a lie. And if it was a lie, if we're going to call it that, it's a necessary lie right now. It is a necessary lie, and the same as at one time, and even contemporaneously it's still true with some people, to believe that, wait a minute, my son is in a terrible fix he is because of the demon alcohol. There are people who still use that term and still their mindset, I think it's what they call it, probably not in those religious circles I'm referring to, but that the demon alcohol has the poor boy. You mean he drinks? Well, demon rum has him, some sort of evil spirit. It sounds, it sounds more sophisticated now, and it is uh, more in the mainstream of life to say, well, wait a minute. Uh, 
my son does have a certain uh, drug dependency. But if you look at the kind of unhealthy pressures present in our modern day society, I'm surprised that we're all not addicted to something. And the experts go, yeah, and even one psychiatrist, if you've got nothing else to say, it comes his turn, they say, it's interesting you mention that because, <laughs> to tell you the truth, I was addicted to uh, amphetamines when I was in high school. And it even got worse. I started doing cocaine when I was in college just to stay awake and study. And the rest of you go, know exactly what you mean. <laughs> because, and the psychiatrist goes on, he doesn't say anything, and I'm not attacking the psychiatrist, but the psychiatrist doesn't say anything because, you know, the person doesn't say, yeah, I did it just because I was some kind of damn weak bastard. I'm just no good. <laughs> what is that? Nobody says that anymore, as if it would prove anything. But they, they simply say, the kind of pressures... The kind of pressures it was to succeed, especially where I went to school. I mean, we're not talking about, you know, South Carolina. You, I was in Harvard. Can you imagine the kind of pressure it was all I could do to get into school, to tell you the truth? And then that kind of pressure, and people were taking drugs. And they all, and everybody would chime in. They're already thinking it. If they don't say it about, yes, that kind of pressure is what we've got to deal with. That kind of unhealthy pressure. They don't say from where. Like, what, from you? From your parents? From society. And it is a kind of factual fabrication that will not stand even their own scrutiny past what they said, as always. Where I was exactly stopped last time we were taping, I wanted to pick up, I'd use the term nationalism in telling you that it, I really meant it in a very wide sense. And there's some specifics in there that we just absolutely ran out of time I wanted to hit that has to do with this because I don't think that the connection was all that clear except for those of you with very clear ears. And what it has to do, like these kinds of examples of these factual fabrications, uh, what I was trying to get to is how, even with experts, they make a local reference. They take the sorts of things that if we were talking indeed, and the human mind could work this way ordinarily, about universal causes. Rather than that, since it, we cannot deal with that at the ordinary level, they localize the analyzation, the explanations are always some type of provincialism. Because I didn't want you to get hung on me using nationalism. It is a form of chauvinism. It is a form of localizing what they seem to be talking about. And it is very important the way it works. And the more they do this, the more it seems to pass for an expert form of explanation, diagnosis, and even identification of the problem by this kind of provincialism. By being able verbally to this kind of provincialism, this kind of local identification and apparent analyzation and explanation, by being able to isolate and specify the explanation, it seems more formidable are formidable. <laughs> very important. Very important in the ordinary world. You do it without thinking about it, whether you're an expert in something or not. You're an expert in you. You're an expert in your opinion with dealing with other people. By isolating, by localizing explanations as opposed to trying to deal, if they could or wanted to, with the question of greater causes. By isolating it, by turning it into a provincial matter, it gives a very distinct, it's not really illusionary, but it gives a very distinct aura. It lands a whole air of it being extremely formidable to be able to do that. If you make, you remember one example we were using, a critic a writer reviews a film, and he's saying the director, whoever it was, Director X, in this film, he very deftly is able to clearly cut open and reveal the dark underbelly of the American dream. All right. In that sentence, in that 
short burst of quantum energy hidden in words, what I am pointing out that is normally overlooked is in this case American, but it's, you can fill in blanks. It could be that this film, the director has deftly cut open and uncovered the dark underbelly of the communist theory of the Christian tyranny and all such as that. And I could make up examples for economic ideas, for social programs. But you notice what they're saying is, and I admit I put it through several stages to try to make your mind operate. I'm, I'm quoting one guy who's making a critique and an observation about somebody else's work. But all of you understand trickery by now, don't you? Well, except for Billy Bob over there. <laughs> Billy Bob just barely understands how zippers work. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little sort of figurative sotto voce physical humor just went on for you people out there in Radio Land. It is the key in this kind of provincialism I want you to see. It is not, I used American Dream because here we are staying in America. The use of this has nothing, nothing, the energy behind it, nothing to do with the specifics of the communist uh, doctrine of the tyranny of Catholicism, the tyranny of Islam, the inequities of capitalism. You understand the first part of me retelling this critic's observation of how the director so deftly, so insightfully was able to cut right to and expose that dark downside, the underbelly of, and then they point out something that ordinarily is taken just at prima facie value as being something positive, the American dream or in other parts of the world, in other minds, the, social, the socialist doctrine, the communist agenda, or from another view, and somebody calling it a, the tyrannies of Islam, to them it's you know, the proper program. But all of that, it is, the comment is being made on a very local level, and it's the adjective in here. The American dream is what gets people caught up, that assuming that somebody's listening to this, well, let's say that they're doing it in another country. The dark underbelly of the Argentinian dream. And the people are sitting around in Buenos Aires and thinking, ah, oh, yes, the kinds of people that would be, I guess, assumed uh, there, if we will compare and parallel it, be considered liberal to such an extreme that they're almost anti-homeland. And so they're sitting around the coffee shops <coughs> in downtown BA, and they're saying, ah, oh, yes, the dark underbelly of the Argentinian dream. And they're sitting there themselves, filling in their pocket, making sure they've got enough pesos or whatever it is, since, you know, they seem to be, the inflation's running like a thousand percent a week, and they're wondering whether they've even got enough to pay for a cup of coffee. And so they're agreeing that, yes, this is something. Or someone who uh, suffered through the, let us say, when the communist or the socialist or anybody was running country X. And they hear that there's a film, now we have some freedom here in our land. Now a director has come out with a film, so I read. They're sitting there in downtown Bucharest, Sofia. And they're going, yes, and it's pointing out, this director, I've got to see this film because it says that he has been able now, since we have a certain amount of freedom, that he is able, through this film, he has exposed a dark underbelly the downside, the hidden black side of the communist doctrine. Oh, and they all go, yes, yes, yes. But you notice in all of this, it is really having nothing to do, if you can see beyond it, it has nothing to do with communism, Romania, Argentina, America, <coughs> capitalism. That's not it. Oh, it's serving the purpose. It's doing something else. But that is not what's going on. It is part of life's beautiful trickery. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it's part of the serious arrangement. 
of things as they are. So that they take out what would appear to be the negative side, the greed of man, the hostility of man, the prejudice of man, all the stuff that is the dark underbelly, not of the American dream, not of the communist doctrine, of man, of man, of man, of man. There is no communist doctrine without man, without somebody to be a communist. You cannot have a communist doctrine if nobody will show up. If you say, all right, I've got this communist doctrine, or I've got the uh, avocado doctrine. It's brand new, and it's really going to take over. I think it will catch on and make, get us all in power, and we can push people around and be big shots. If nobody shows up, you ain't got no avocado doctrine. You can say, yeah, I do. It's right here. I wrote it down. i got a whole program. I listed it all out. But you do understand there is no such thing. i got the plans here for Harvard. I got all figured out about how great it will be. We'll have ivy up on the walls once we have some walls and buildings. And everybody will be real taken by it and they'll be impressed, especially if they went to South Carolina U. And if nobody shows up, you don't have a Harvard. Let's say you got the money and nothing else to do and you go build all the facilities, the physical plant. But you do understand there is no Harvard if no one shows up. There is nothing in the secondary world without people. Not, not, not. There is no Christianity, no Islam, no socialism, no nothing. They can even be the physical buildings. They can be the physical, tangible manifestations, you might think, of here it is, the government buildings. Here is the Kremlin. But there is no government. There is no USSS or government unless there are people. There is nothing without man. There is no society. So rather than dealing with what would be the questions of, now it's up to you, I'm just using the kind of common terms, that they would mean when they say the dark underbelly of the American dream or the communist doctrine. All right, and if you say, well, be a little more specific, what does the film get into? Well, as you might imagine, say the guy sitting around the coffee shop in Buenos Aires, or in Bucharest or anywhere, and they say, well, the film, very specifically, if you're interested, yeah, well, tell me. Well, it gets down to one of these guys, he's pursuing the Argentinian dream. He's trying to become a good communist, but I don't know. The man is just, he seems to be heartless. There seems to be something in his childhood, or I don't know what, but uh, every time he gets a little power, he begins to misuse his friends. He, he starts off believing in the Argentinian dream, the American dream, the communist dream of more equality, and we'll all be you know, brothers and sisters together, and we'll share... But boy, as soon as he gets a little power, he begins to screw his friends. Everybody, oh, yeah. There is the dark underbelly of the American dream, of the communist idea. No, it's not. You're talking about humans. Forget. You could say, well, that's the dark underbelly of Harvard. That's true. I mean, it seems, it seems like an admirable place, and everybody that's interested in education would like to go there. But boy, you get there, and guess what? You, you get there showing up wearing, you know, polyester double knit suit from Kmart. And they're going to treat you like dirt. All they can say, yes, you know, we're big shots. And, but you start getting around people named Cabot and Kennedy. You see how they treat you. They can say, oh, we're all here together. You know, we, we wish, in fact, you could come join our fraternity. But Jesus, we just filled the last spot just before you got here yesterday. They don't fool me. That's the dark underbelly of even Harvard, the most liberal, progressive institution. Screw an institution. There is no institution. There is no society. There is no communist dream. You're talking about people. But if you're going to talk about people, if you're going to talk about using their terms again, these are not my terms. If you're going to talk about the greed, the prejudice, the aggression, the hostility, if you've got a book to you know, list all the negative emotions of man, just pick them out. That is what they're trying to talk about. Except that it's too general. It is too universal. And if you said that, it's like you've said it all. If you're going to be an expert and they say, well, you're an expert, you are a whatever you say you are. You say, well, I'm a psychiatrist. I'm a sociologist. I am this country's greatest social critic and observer. Okay, well, tell us your great social observation. I say that people are full of it. <laughs> And the moderator, there any of you realizes, well, this show's got another goddamn 59 minutes to go, and they're waiting, well, you know, what is it? And the person said, well, that's it. <laughs> you know, they can try to talk a while longer, like, well, you're a graduate of Harvard, aren't you? And Princeton, yes, yes. And you've been in your field, I mean, you didn't just graduate yesterday. You know, 
I'm using a walker. What do you think? I'm 90 years old. I've been, I've been observing this. And so all of your expertise, all of your background leads you to say what? The guy says, I just told you. Humans are full of it. And you realize, well, we've got 58 minutes left. <laughs> the point being, even if you are a smart ass enough, you're an ordinary person, you went, boy, is that true? Are you going to sit there for 58 minutes of silence? Or do you take that as being some great observation? If somebody say, well, people are full of it. You might say, yeah, boy, I agree. But you know, what's the rest of it? It is too general. You have to localize the explanation. That is where it comes in that you cannot talk about using their kind of terms now. You cannot talk about the dark underbelly, the downside of humans. Because if you do, you might as well just say, get over and say, well, humans are full of it. That's the extent of my expertise. Thank you. Thank you. You're not considered an expert. Anybody can say that, right? Sure. But the expert says, well, being a sociologist, being interested in our society here in Argentina, born, grew up here in Buenos Aires, it struck me that there is, beyond the great Argentinian dream in El Nai, like, well, we know what that is, because it would be the same if we were in the country where uh, the communist doctrine still had some kind of positive connotation at the time or some capitalistic equality, whatever it was, the people, the Argentinian dream simply represents what religious people, would-be Christians, would say, you know, living a godly life. In other words, the positive goal, the Argentinian dream, the American dream, the communist dream, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the guy says, but, now see, we're not getting to an expert, not a guy who just says, hey, humans are full of it. Do you mean specifically us Argentines? Yep. Everybody else too. Us no, no better, no worse. Us, everybody's full of it. God, 59 minutes, eh? Jesus. But if you say, my field of interest, my expertise, my papers, my doctoral thesis, and the books I've written thus far, which are on sale later in the lobby, have to do with, that it, it struck me, the Argentinian dream, and they all go, yeah, yeah, we know what that is. You know, it has a dark underbelly. <laughs> ah, now we're getting somewhere. When you get into the, the specifics, the way in which we have tried to run, I'm just going to start making up this crap, you know, the way we have recently tried to run a dual, a parallel, or a dual economic slice political system of trying to have capitalism and private enterprise on one side and then still a great deal of social work being done by the government, of a lot of government ownership of some of the larger industries. The way we have tried to do this has produced within what should have been the middle class, and by now all the panelists and everybody nodding because this man's obviously an expert. Nobody knows where it's going, but the man's getting an expert because he's getting specific he is isolating. He's not talking about, hey, humans are full of it, including Argentines. Thank you. No, no, no. The man's getting the great Argentine dream, the dark side, because of, and he starts getting more and more specific, making a local analyzation that it, uh, we have tried to run a parallel, a split, a dual approach toward social programs, toward the distribution of wealth, toward free enterprise. What it has done is made what should have been the middle class. All these terms, middle class, capitalism, free enterprise, all this, the words mean nothing unless you're an ordinary person out there and you think, oh, this is important. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. It's apparently getting more and more into the area of expertise. All of those terms, and he gets more and more specific, begins to point out the negative, the downside of the Argentinian dream, the communist dream, the Christian dream, the Islamic ideal, whatever it is, has a downside, but then he starts getting more and more specific about, well, by doing this, it has caused what used to be the middle class to lose more and more of their social position. They have less and less money to spend. They cannot save, and so they're now being driven to assume some of the less civilized aspects of what used to be the lower criminal class. We have taken some of the strides that we made in the past 
when our children will be getting a better education and we're and it goes on and on. And you go, yes, 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 yes. And it comes out what it amounts to, and it'll end up that it's again, and to use this example, it ends up being some sort of felonious unhealthy influence of this society, in this case, the Argentine society. And you're like, well, yeah. That it's good that we got experts, it's good we can discuss this, and at least get more specific. Get closer to the real problems. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Getting to the causes. By making... The observation, the critique, by making the explanations more local, such as the American dream, the downside, the underbelly of the American dream, the communist doctrine, Christianities, tyrannies, the blind side of Buddhism, See, <laughs> the ordinary intellect picks up the wrong word from the view we're taking right now. It's not that there's a right one. But they fall upon the adjective, the American dream, the Buddhist blind side, the Christian tyranny. By localizing it, although I was talking about in general, there are three specific things that might spur some of you on to jump the track. The three things become possible at a, after making these ordinary general downside underbelly, dark underbelly of man, greed, prejudice, tyranny, aggression, whatever. Instead of that, that kind of generalized statement about humanity, by making it local. But then what I was pointing at in general, there are three things then become possible. One is the speaker, I guess I already made that clear enough, but the speaker, if you can hear what I'm pointing at, takes on the immediate appearance of an expert. It doesn't matter whether you agree with them, whether you're interested, it's just surely you can hear what I'm saying. The difference between, even if they said, here it is, Dr. So-and-so from Princeton, and he's going to give his comment on the nature of the American dream, or the American society, where we are today. And he says, thank you. My view is that we're all full of it. You got to localize it. Nobody would take that as an expert. You think, well, it's some kind of joke, or the man's deranged. Old timer's disease is taking over his brain. I don't know why they why they keep mispronouncing that and they call it Alzheimer's or some kind of crap. I assume don't they mean old time? At any rate. But the man has got to get localized and say, well, what strikes me, what strikes me is the breakup, there's several stages, and he can get, all, get more and more specific. He can say, it seems to me that there's been a kind of deterioration that many people have observed of the age-old nuclear family, which has led to less of a direct family parental influence on our school systems, which has resulted in children having less and less of an interest in specific, liberal, academic education. And thus we have the kind of dark underbelly of man that we thought was being outbred <laughs> through our civilized efforts of the last 200 years here in our fine country, and now we find what? Crime on the increase, not only in high school, but now children in grammar school carrying guns. <laughs> and even one little never had a book a bad poetry. <laughs> Simply catch, this is not, as you know, this is not, a, this is not a critique of our critics. This is not sarcasm. But just notice, you have got to get specific. Or once a, a, an expert, if it just be you talking about you, you won't pass as an expert. You won't pass as being a kind of Socratic, reflective, intellectual person that people say, uh, weren't you always interested in meditation and taking drugs and stuff back when I saw you 10 years ago? And you say, yeah. And you say, well, uh, what have you learned? You, you told me that your greatest, your whole raison d'etre, you said, was that you wanted to learn about you or the nature of life. You say, yes, I've continued to work on it. In fact, I just wrapped up 
one of my stages last week. And they say, <laughs> and, your, and your past friend says, well, what have you learned in these 10 years since I saw you? You say, well, I have learned, I, well, I tell you, you know, I sense the basis is what kind of guy I was, what kind of person I am, as Socrates and everyone else knew. you got to know that to understand life. And they say, well, tell me, now that you've studied yourself and taken drugs and ruined your health and all that, what have you found out about you? You say, well, I tell you, I now know what kind of guy I am. I'm full of it. <laughs> you had to get more specific. You had to say, well, I have, I've learned for a long time. Last time I saw you, as a matter of fact, you recall, I was living in a commune. I was trying to do good work. I was out contributing free time down at the clinic. But the more I studied, the more I thought about it, I realized, I never told you this, but my father, my father used to dress up like a clown. <laughs> On the weekend, and the worst part, he dressed up like a female clown. And my mother used to drink. And it struck me after years, it took me years to see this, but I was out trying to do good work with other people, and sometimes I'd realize when I'd try to help somebody, and somebody, you know, maybe I would give them some used clothes, and people say, well, this is out of style, don't you have anything better? And sometimes I'd get a little, oh, I don't know, I hate to say it, but I guess I can say it now, I'd get a kind of, you know, a little edgy with them. And for a long time, I couldn't understand why. I just kind of pushed down my mind. I thought, oh, no. You know, I look more and more every day when I glance in the mirror. I look more and more like I could have been Albert Schweitzer's illegitimate son. But now it finally strikes me. So you get more and more specific. You begin to tell what kind of guy you are on the basis of the dark underbelly of me that I began to, I just wanted you to see. You become, even at a very personal level between you and one other person, or you represent yourself as an expert in some academic discipline. You have to get specific. And once the analyzation, once the explanation becomes localized, you then begin to pass more as an expert. Is one thing that can happen. A second thing that can come about from this is that the listeners can get all entangled in what appear in the safe, the superfluous parts, such as in the dark underbelly of the American dream, is they get all hung up on the other American dream. And from there it's you know, the unhealthy pressures of America. As much as I love her, there are many things wrong. We're not perfect, and there are all kinds of unhealthy influences in our society. And we need to clean them up to even make our country, the great state of Albania, better. We've got to work on it. It gets the listeners entangled in the provincialism. It gets entangled in the adjectives. The downside of the communist dream, the Catholic dream, Irish dream, the capitalist dream, the Billy Bob dream. <laughs> and everybody gets entangled in that, see, and it's safe. It's superfluous, and it keeps one from trying to wrestle with any kind of serious question about the, to use their terms again, the dark underbelly or the downside of human nature. Using their terms, I'm not saying there is, but that's what they're talking about. That's all you can talk about. You can't talk about the dark underbelly of society. Or well, sure you can, but there is no society out in people. You can't talk about the intolerance and the social and even intellectual prejudice of those in the elite schools like Oxford. You're talking about people at Oxford. No, 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 no. You can't say that or you just have to say, well, everybody that goes to Oxford is full of it. In fact, I think anybody that goes to college is full of it. What kind of expert is that? That's nothing. That is not the most efficient transfer of energy in life. Not now, as witnessed by the fact that it's not. <laughs> now, I rest my case, <laughs> which I don't guess is necessary because my case was not exceptionally tired, but we'll go on. <laughs> it also, just to wrap up, I said three things. It thus takes man's overall attention, pulls it away from any possible inquiry, any concern over real causes, and leaves them to wrestle with, if not to accept, the ever viscid presentation of explanations, which is where we started last show of explanations being taken, accepted, as causes. Not through dumbness, 
But once you see it, it goes on continually. It goes on inside of your head. It goes on out here in society. <laughs> Amongst people. Why does a dog go around and wet the fence? Why doesn't he go out and play in the field in the grass? Why does he run around the edge of that fence? What causes him to do that? Oh, okay. Because other dogs have done it, and he's going on top of it. He cannot help it. He has got the territory. They'll mark where they did. There it is. Why is Billy Bob a drunk? What caused the man? He had such promise as a little nipper. What caused him to turn out to be a drunken, part-time drywall repairman? <laughs> <laughs> because his father was. His father was a drunk and mistreated that lad. He used to beat him with a trowel. <laughs> Ah, so there's the cause. Now, those are explanations, except that's as far as man is wired up to need to go. It's not his fault individually, unless you know better, and that's your fault. But then if you know better, you, know, you can take fault or not take fault. Some people, when it rains, wear rubbers, and other people refuse to be seen because of the unhipped. I don't think I'll go any further with that. I was going to make a joke having to do with... Sexual protection and people's galoshers, but never mind. We're in a hurry. Make up your own jokes. Of course, if you can actually make them up, they're not jokes. Uh, do note, since I had to use the term, I just wanted you to not get distracted even. I said nationalism last time and in its greatest sense, that is, of always localizing a problem, some area that people are apparently discussing. They will localize it, and by nationalism, of course, you see by now is including everything from actual nationalistic, uh, jingoistic sentiments to religious uh, affiliations to <laughs> political uh, alignments, everything. But I just wanted to point out, since everything is a reflection of something, that this kind of provincialism is not the same kind of inner human drive that would make a person fight and defend their territory, their family, and even their homeland. But at that level, their homeland has no boundaries. They, don't, they can't look down and see a boundary between uh, Bolivia and Colombia and say, wait a minute, somebody came over here and spit above this line, and this is in my homeland. That is something else. And what we're talking about is not that, but I just thought I'd mention there is, of course, as you should know, there is a primary <laughs> validity to what people think of and want to call in general, in very hasty, casual manners, patriotism, etc. But the fighting to defend one territory, a dog, a human, to, to fight the territory is not the same thing as the kind of provincialism that I'm speaking of now that has to isolate explanations as to why somebody does something, why I got in this fight, why we got in this war. This kind of provincialism, what it amounts to, it comes out like a secondary manifestation of a more primary territorial prerogative. And so there is always that going on. But what people believe that they fight over, what they say they fight over, <coughs> if it were true, if it could be absolutely isolated, if it could be isolated uh, take still examples that are presently known. Between the uh, Catholics and the Protestants in Northern Ireland, if they, since nobody has invaded anybody's territory and they've got a wall set up there, they're fight, apparently fighting over ideas. They'll put it another way, but they're fighting over secondary ideas. But notice the power this has. Notice the staying power. As they would say in the philosophers of Broadway, this kind of conflict has legs. This thing will play forever, relatively speaking. But notice, since we're in a place I can make an example, just in the last few months, they still pop up. If it gets down to a more primary level, such as Iraq invading Kuwait, that was territory. You are getting closer now, relatively speaking, but you're getting much closer to a dog protecting territory. Now, I know they got more complicated than other people got in, but there's a difference between a Kuwait 
and other people getting involved, but there'd be a difference between country X turning and fighting country Y that invaded them and actually took over their territory. But notice how short-lived the damn thing was 100 hours. Because that is a very primary and in a sense a not too efficient use of energy. It doesn't have legs. Those kind of fights won't <coughs> last long. Any more than if somebody comes over in, in your backyard one morning, you get them, you look, and there's a band of people that were living next door. You, you see them put up tents and a mobile home over there, and one morning you get up, and they're over 10 feet into your backyard. That's pretty easily handled. It'll be handled quickly. But notice the staying power, because it is a continual change of energy when it gets into more secondary areas. It gets into provincial conflicts, such as the Catholics and the Protestants in Northern Ireland, or the great conflict, that running game in Lebanon. It's amongst themselves, evidently. Nobody came in and attacked Lebanon. Iraq didn't do that, and they fight to run them out. It's inside now. Forget the Emerald Isle of our great some of your great forefathers of Ireland. Forget the one time jewel living casino of the Mediterranean Beirut. And here, you localize what appears to be the explanation, you localize to a secondary level what appears to be conflicts, and you explain it on that basis, and you can run with it forever. In your case, 67, 72 years. Huh, boy, I'll get this figured out shortly. <laughs> if I can just run, figuratively speaking, those blanks, those Catholics out of my brain, or from the other view, these, the Protestants, or if we're in Lebanon, if we can just run the Shiites out of here, somebody says, wait a minute, Shiites? We got the Christians and the Jews down here. Wait a minute. It can go on forever. It is the expertise, it is the factual fabrication of explanations that are provincial. They're not really territorial. You're not actually fighting for brain space that means anything. You're not trying to drive the Iraqis out of the streets and your bedroom and your banks and your car dealerships out of Kuwait City. The people here, you're fighting fellow Lebanese, fellow Irish. They just got the wrong idea. <laughs> it's the dark underbelly of being Irish. That's the downside of being Lebanese. That's the downside of being a religious. It will go on forever, as I said, 62 to 70, 67 to 72 years, <laughs> which is about as long I've just been cut off. So that's the end of that. Next time we will... <laughs>